Uh, welcome to the second session on energy demand. Um, and we have uh, a long session with uh, six speakers lined up for you and then even some discussion afterwards. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Uh, so hi, I'm Camila Caligari from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I'll talk today about the demand hidden in the shed and its impacts on modeling passage activity. This work was only possible due to the collaboration between COP and IASA, and I would like to thank both institutions for this opportunity. Now, the first thing that you are may wonder right now is what is this demand hidden in the shadow? Now, the shadow economy, which is also called underground, formal, or parallel economy, includes all economic activities that avoid government regulation, taxation, or observation. That's why it's called by shadow economy because we can see it. And the daily life is surrounded by examples of shadow activities. Like for instance, a businessman that decides not to resist with the tax administration or is still resisted, but as another service provider. Just like this, there are other examples that could be given without going to legal issues, such as drug sales and money laundering. Even through the underground had long been a fact of life, and they did not go unnoticed by the spread of the COVID-19, which brought the issue into the spotlight. It was clear that the Shannon economy makes official statistics, like the ones related to income and GDP, unreliable. The Shannon economy is not only a matter of tax evasion, but also a matter of socioeconomic development. And this issue is what motivates this work. Here, we try to understand how the shadow economy affects the demand model. So in this regard, this presentation, this talk, show an analysis of how the shadow economy influences the econometric demand model. And we drive all this discussion through the implementation of a multinomial logic model developed by Sheffer in 2017 which rely, among other variables, on GDP level as the dependent variable. Just to show that is the set of equations that we are working with, and as you can see, the GDP is an important driver. So, summarizing, our experiment try to answer two questions. The first one is, what is the impact of the shadow economy on parameter estimations? And the second question is, can the model proposed by Sheffer for United States be applied worldwide. So to do so, we tested this hypothesis in four economies, three developments, the European Union, Japan, and the United States, and one emerging economy, that's Brazil. So these economies were selected due to their availability, also the economic context, and the transportation demand stage. So this factor allows us to assess both the impact of the shadow economy as the universality of the model proposed by Shep. So let's start the fun part of the work that is to answer all these questions. The, que the first question that we need to answer is, what is the size of the shadow economy? So uh, the results obtained may surprise those not familiar with the literature. Uh, as you can see here in this figure, the country with the lowest level of informality is Switzerland, which has a shadow economy corresponding to 7% of the official GDP. And this figure helps us understand how the shadow economy is distributed across the group. Uh, we can conclude from this figure that the lower is the GDP per capita, the higher is the share of the shadow economy. And in the developing world, as you can see, the shadow economy is huge. There is a whole economy working on the ground, the official data in those places. So, this leads us to our second question. How bad is not just the shadow economy into the demand models? The answer depends on the country that you are analyzing for sure, like here, for example, the country that we are analyzing. Brazil has 37%, US 8%, and Japan 10%. Europe has around 
And, that, and the answer also depends on the model that you are working with. For example, if you are estimating the travel demand or any travel based on the per capita GDP using a simple linear regression, if you don't include the shadow economy, you can overestimate the parameters by 26% for Brazil, in this case, just as, as an example, while the impact for Japan is about 7%. But if you are working with a more complex model, like Schaeffer's model, the results change. For the developed economies, IU, Japan, and the US, to assume the shadow economy into the GDP level to better represent consumer, it's not significant. In contrast for Brazil, there is a slight impact on total demand, and these figures help us to understand it. So here in blue, we have the model fitted assuming the official GDP, and in pink, assuming the official GDP plus the shadow economy. This first plot uh, will help us uh, to see the absolute values uh, using the historical data for this both model. And here we can see the difference in total demand. So what is the conclusion? Eh? That for Brazil, the model fitted, assuming only official GDP, overestimates the total demand by 5%. Notable, not to account for the shadow economy, is especially critical for models that rely only on GDP levels as a dependent variable, because it lacks other parameters' influences. However, even in more complex model, we can see, we can measure uh, these impacts. So based on the discussion about the influences of the shadow economy on parameter estimation, we simulated the total demand incorporating the shadow economy into the modeling approach proposed by Sheffer. And here we are using a SSP2 scenario adjusted. And we can observe that following all these assumptions, uh, the model can represent the best very well for all economies, providing a good fit. And other insights are that Brazil, you continue to increase the total mobility. The IU tends to reduce the total demand in the long term. Japan is likely to face a decrease in transportation demand, mainly due to the declining population, and the U.S. continues to be the measure mark for transportation services. Uh, the next figure uh, provides the per capita passenger kilometer travel, and some conclusions can also uh, be drawn. Uh, the first one is that the average Brazilian will more than double its total mobility in the next 40 years, going from 8,000 kilometers in 2010 to 19 kilometers traveled in 2050. The average European may stabilize the travel demand in 2030. The average Japanese also stabilized the total demand, but already in 2010. And finally, the average American will not stabilize as a, as as is expected, and will continue to increase the mobility rates, although already in a declining pace. So, heading now to the final considerations, uh, two messages stand out about the issue that we wrote. The first one, it's necessary, we need to recognize the shadow economy existence, capturing it into the official GDP data, and also into the SSP2 SP, SSP storylines to better describe the demand, mainly in developing economies where the informality is more uh, relevant. The second message is related to the model proposed by Shep. Uh, the model proposed uh, a good, uh, he can represent uh, the past very well and all the evolution of the transportation system in the economies and allied. And therefore, uh, we could use the, the model to estimate the travel demand worldwide. And finally, as we saw, the total transportation demand will continue to increase in the, four, the fossil fuel consumptions and all the great gas emissions deriving from the transportation uh, sector. 
So uh, that's all. Uh, and now it's open for questions. Thanks a lot, Camilla. That was uh, very nice. So once again, type your questions in the Q&A uh, box so we can actually pick up on them here. Um, I have one uh, question for you to, uh, to start with. Is there any, um, because the shadow economy is often in some of these methods actually uh, estimated based on uh, electricity use. And so when it comes to often a sort of cyclic uh, method between um, between estimating the shadow economy and estimating energy use, because you don't know which one actually you're, you're looking at. Is there a similar risk around transport? Uh, are uh, some of these methods using transport activity as an, uh, as an no, indicator I, of shadow economy? Uh, the method that uh, I used was an econometric model that estimates the money, so they see the money. Because the shadow economy is difficult to measure by definition because we don't have official data. So we need to have some other methods. In transportation, uh, I don't say anything related to, but I use it some data that is based on money counting. Then they estimated the informality. I use it this method. Okay, thank you. I don't see any questions coming. That could be on uh, on my side. I have one other because did I see correctly that the adjusted model had a slightly lower demand for energy, basically than the than the the, the model without the uh, the informal economy? And how would you? Uh, so did I see that correctly? And how would you explain it? Yeah, because what happens? If I don't have, if I don't assume the informal, informal, the elasticity is wrong because with like $10, I will travel 15 kilometers. But in reality, I need to have $15 to travel the 15 kilometers because the data that we have don't see it. So the elasticity is wrong. So it's overestimate uh, the model. So when you assume the informality, you underestimate these permits to represent the real money that they have in their pockets, not the data. Because when you see like the energy, they consume energy and gasoline for everything. So when you count the PKT and the money, it's there is something else between us. So that's the point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very nice presentation as well. Um, so let's move on to the second presentation around uh, transport energy demand um, and invite Paige Jadun, I hope I pronounced it correctly, um, to the stage uh, to talk about the um, disruptive mobility changes. And yes, that's all displaying correctly. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, my name is Paige Jaden, very close, um, and I'm a researcher at the National Renewable Energy Lab in the U.S. Um, before starting, I just want to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues who are listed here, and then also want to state um, that all of my views here are my own, and I am not representing the Department of Energy or the U.S. government. So for the past century or so, uh, the transportation sector has been dominated by petroleum use. Um, it's also been primarily dominated by light duty vehicle ownership for most personal travel. Um, and that's been the same for decades. Um, however, radical transformations within the sector are likely on the way. Uh, and these transformations will be driven by things like new technologies, um, new mobility options and business models like ride hailing, Uber and Lyft. Um, and like many of us are familiar right now, maybe technologies like telecommuting, um, but they also will be driven by rapid technology advancements in things like electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles and uh, potentially local and uh, national policies like zero emission vehicle mandates and gasoline vehicle bans. Um, and at the same time that all of this is happening in the transportation sector, the power sector is also changing. Um, so we're seeing high levels of renewables um, that provide an opportunity to decarbonize the demand sector through electrification. 
Uh, and then with this electrification, we see a growing value in demand side flexibility. So given all of these simultaneous changes, transitioning from a petroleum-based system to alternative fuels, uh, most notably electricity, but also potentially uh, fuels like hydrogen, um, is going to introduce unprecedented changes in technology adoption, as well as create new integration opportunities um, with other sectors. So these types of disruptive changes that are possible are gonna have profound changes on transportation demand. So including household travel behavior, technology adoption, vehicle ownership, and then also the associated energy use and emissions uh, from that demand. So to understand the potential magnitude and implications of these changes, we use the Temple model um, to analyze alternative potential scenarios of the future transportation system, uh, particularly scenarios of widespread electric vehicle adoption and increased ride hailing. Um, so what is the TEMPO model? Uh, TEMPO stands for the Transportation, Energy, and Mobility Pathway Options Model, and it's a sector-wide transportation model that was developed at NREL um, over the past two years. Um, so the model is really meant to fill a gap within the modeling space to understand the inter interconnections of um, the future transportation system with other sectors, so most notably the power grid. Um, and also to understand um, the, you know, the potential for radical transformation in both the supply and the demand for transportation. Um, so Tempo is a national US-based model. It's long-term, so looking out to 2050 and covers the entire sector, both passenger and freight. Um, a key attribute is that Tempo also includes an hourly energy demand resolution um, to really understand the potential timing of demand. Um, so timing of demand isn't that relevant when we're thinking about the current gasoline infrastructure, uh, but it's really critical when we start thinking about electricity demand and electricity supply. The figure shows just a simple representation of the model. So key inputs in orange and blue um, include transportation service demand and also technology attributes for available modes and technologies like vehicle cost, fuel economy, fuel cost, et cetera. Um, and then given these inputs, the core of the model, which is the green circle shown here, is choice. Um, so choice in the model is executed both at the trip level, um, so modes and technologies are decided on uh, for each trip taken by a household, and then also on an annual level. So what kind of technology will be adopted, how many vehicles will be owned, um, and then the model then estimates system level outcomes like energy use and emissions. And I want to dive into one key aspect of the model in more detail since it plays a key role in assessing um, the potential for disruptive scenarios. So Tempo has a unique representation of passenger demand uh, where the fundamental unit of choice is a household. Um, so it's, it's a, everyone in the household instead of maybe an individual driver or an individual traveler. So households make decisions um, based on the fleet of vehicles that they own, and as well as their daily travel requirements. So how many trips they need to make throughout the week. So within Tempo, we disaggregate households um, shown in this green box um, in ways that, that impact travel behavior. So the household composition, how many people are in the household, income, and then as well as urban classification. So is it an urban or rural area? Um, and then the figure on the right shows the impact that this type of disaggregation can have within the model. So the figure shows uh, mode choice in tempo and how the mode choice changes at increasing trip distances. So the left panel shows households um, with some drivers in an urban area with low income. And you can see a high share of trips are no energy in pink, which is things like walking and biking. Um, and it makes up a, the, the majority of short distance trips. Um, and as you move into longer distances, you see more of a differentiation. So um, there's more personal LDV, but you also have modes like bus, metro, and rail, um, and then it switches to air. Uh, but this is in high contrast with the figure on the right, which shows a rural middle income household. So there's much less mode differentiation here. Trips are mostly dominated by personal LDV usage. Um, so these types of nuances and household characteristics can really impact um, the competitiveness of different modes and technologies, um, and these all get aggregated up to inform national level results. So using this model representation, uh, we looked at a selection of potential disruptive scenarios um, to understand the impact on energy and emissions. Um, and this was really an initial analysis of the potential scenarios that we can run with the model. Um, and I really want to emphasize that these were meant to be exploratory scenarios um, and are not meant to be forecasts or predictions of what we think is going to happen in the future. 
Um, so as a starting point for comparison, we have a baseline, um, which is just largely consistent with the EIA um, annual energy outlook reference case. We also model an advanced electric vehicle technology scenario. So this has lower vehicle costs for electric vehicles driven by cheaper batteries and also higher efficiencies. Um, and then to push electric vehicle adoption even further, we model an internal combustion engine vehicle or ICEV phase out scenario where there are no gasoline vehicle sales allowed after 2035. Um, and lastly, we explore a scenario with increased ride hailing. Um, so this is driven by reductions in cost and time of ride hailing um, and could represent a future with automated vehicles that have lower ride hail, a lower operating cost in a ride hailing fleet um, and maybe more efficient fleet operation, so a lower wait time. So for the following results for these scenarios, um, we focus just on the impacts related to personal travel, uh, personal transport for this discussion. Um, so just for reference, we aren't really looking at the impacts of freight um, here in these slides. So on to some of the results. Uh, the figure here shows the estimated personal LVB stock for our various scenarios. Um, so the baseline case, which as much as it is today, is largely dominated by internal combustion engine vehicles, which is that large gray chunk. Um, you see some penetration of hybrids, some penetration of electric vehicles uh, in yellow. And then in the advanced EV technology scenario, um, this reflects the changing cost component competitiveness now of different technologies. So now we have EVs that are much cheaper. Um, so with those lower costs, EV stock penetration reaches about 50% by 2050. Um, however, to get to a full transition from gasoline vehicles is likely going to require additional drivers. So as shown in the ICEV phase out, uh, which reaches about 95% EVs by 2050. Then on the far right, uh, the increased ride hailing includes the impact of reduced vehicle ownership due to these alternative options. Um, so people may be more likely to get rid of an owned vehicle if they can rely more on ride sharing, which is now cheaper and more efficient. Um, so the next result uh, kind, of, kind of shows the level of detail and a different look at the outputs produced by the model. Um, so this shows technology and kind of a high level mode choice at more of a trip level. Um, so the chart shows the share of person miles traveled by trip distance, um, and it's colored by the light duty vehicle technology and then as well as mode. Um, so it's either a light duty vehicle technology, green is uh, mobility as a service or ride sharing, and then the dark gray is other modes, which includes things like bus, air, um, and rail. Um, so the technology choice for light duty vehicles kind of largely reflects what we saw on the previous slide, but there are a few more nuances at a trip level um, that can impact energy use. And so one of those is that, for example, uh, the share of e electric vehicle trips as a fraction of light duty vehicle trips decreases at longer distances. Um, so as you move across longer distances, your LDB shares um, become, become less made up of electric vehicles. And that's because households are more likely to take in a conventional vehicle with a longer range, um, you know, they are range limited at those longer trip distances. Um, you can also see in the far right, for example, that we have an increased share of ride hailing trips, which is that green, um, and it's still, uh, even with that reduced cost, still a modest fraction of miles. And what's not shown here, um, this is all at the national level aggregation, um, is that these trip distributions and the choices change within the different household types for each scenario. Um, so household travel behavior can impact the competitiveness of different technologies. So for example, households with a smaller share of long distance trips, so more short trips like maybe uh, lower income or urban households may have increased EV adoption relative to other households um, since they aren't as impacted by some of these range constraints. Um, so some of these nuances and the competitiveness of different modes and technologies can be examined here by looking at different households and looking at different trips um, and trip distributions. Um, so finally, the last set of results here shows the magnitude of these potential disruptions on the energy use and emissions. Um, so the top panel shows the absolute energy by fuel on the left and then the CO2 emissions on the right. Um, and the bottom panel shows the relative difference compared to a baseline scenario. Um, so we can see significant reductions um, of kind of across the scenarios and primarily driven to electric vehicle adoption since the higher efficiencies of those electric vehicles displaces energy from conventional technologies. 
Um, and again, I want to stress this is just personal transport. So some of these effects might be amplified when considering freight. Um, we also see some energy and emissions reductions due to increased ride hailing since those vehicles uh, may operate more efficiently, um, but again, a little bit more modest than some of the others. Uh, but that could increase with higher levels of penetration of potentially increased sharing um, opportunities. So to conclude, uh, this analysis represents somewhat of a first pass um, into exploring these disruptive scenarios with the Tempo model, um, but it highlighted many key insights. Uh, so the first is that transportation disruption can have far-reaching effects on the entire energy system, so especially on the power sector. Um, so we know that EV penetration can decrease energy use and also emissions, um, but it also requires a substantial increase in load, so on the order of 15 to 25 percent of an increase in electricity. Um, so how will the power sector need to evolve to meet that demand? Um, and we know that we can use this hourly resolution of travel demand in the model to inform charging decisions um, and get at some of the more uh, complex multi-sectoral dynamics like opportunities for flexible charging and impact on peak load. Um, and then just in the interest of time, uh, you know, we see that there's values in modeling these types of disruptive scenarios that maybe haven't been um, looked at much on a national level historically. Um, and we want to continue pursuing some of these additional disruptions um, that could happen like virtual travel, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. And we hope to develop and explore those with the Tempo model moving forward. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I can answer any questions. Okay. Thanks, Paige. Uh, that was very nice and great work. Um, yeah, so people, please put your questions in the Q&A, then we can uh, answer them. There seems to be a bit of a delay between that before things show up, because the questions show up just after the speaker has gone off stage. So if you can put your questions in somewhat earlier, that, may, that makes sense. Um, so I have one question while the others are maybe coming in. Um, OK, well, let me see here. There's one from Lisette, actually, on whether you consider the impact of the pandemic on travel behavior and whether you uh, believe this is something that makes sense to explore on the longer term. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's something we've been really interested in exploring. We didn't do it for this analysis, uh, but it's kind of on the top of our uh, to-do list. Um, and, and how we're thinking of approaching that is right now we have kind of travel demand distributions in aggregate. Um, but if we can disaggregate the travel demand by trip purpose, so things like work, um, shopping, you know, school, um, we can really understand how the pandemic, you know, affects those types of trips and then put that type of uh, behavior and those types of impacts in the model. So I think it is definitely important to explore long term. I don't think this is going to be the only pandemic um, that, we'll, that we'll look at. So I think it's very important and it's, yeah. Uh, on our to-do list to look at for sure. <laughs> yeah let me see there's then across the other questions that come in one on uh, whether there's a difference between the in vehicle composition between the personal and the and the ride hailing fleets and my own question is actually how you deal with the difference also then in the service that's provided actually between having an own vehicle and the, and the ride hailing whether there's any diff uh what do you how, how, yeah how you deal with the fact that that's uh, a slightly different service being provided and then yeah, so for the first question, the composition changes a little bit between the personal LDV and the uh, ride hailing. So the kind of cost of ownership that we calculate is different, um, whereas the ride hailing vehicles have a much higher vehicle miles traveled because they're satisfying more trips. Um, um, so that really kind of maybe benefits electric vehicles a little bit more because they have a lower marginal cost. Um, and we also have a different formulation of the logit um, for that, where it's a little bit more cost focused than on the personal side, where there's other factors that um, that impact adoption, maybe like preference or just kind of um, inertia for, for different technologies. Um, and then I'm sorry, the other question was for the different use profiles or the different kind of utility. Um, so that's one that we're looking to develop a little bit more um, Right now, the kind of decision between trips, mode choice, and technology is based on cost and time. Um, but we're hoping to add other factors into that, like convenience, um, safety, to really evaluate and understand how people value different modes. So for example, maybe it's not that different to take a ride hail to work versus your own vehicle, but maybe you can leave your, your bag in the car as you go to work. So there's some trade-offs that aren't captured by cost and time. 
um, that we're hoping to improve upon to to really capture these nuances and these trade-offs a little bit more. Um, but currently, essentially, a, a, a household can choose to use ride hailing and potentially drop a vehicle if there's a significant increase uh, in utility by doing so. So essentially, if the cost is low enough um, by using ride hailing instead of an own vehicle past a certain threshold, then um, they can decide to use that mode. OK. Thank you. There's many more questions now in the Q&A. So, um, Feel free to answer those actually uh, once uh, the next speaker is on the stage. And so now we are actually moving on to a block with uh, two, the two last speakers who are more looking into um, to household level lifestyles and uh, the effects of broader consumption than just the sectoral uh, effects of uh, appliances and of uh, transport. So first we have Claire Henmer uh, from University of East Anglia to talk about uh, a downscaling tool for IM uh, results. So welcome, Claire. Hello. So my slides are just uploading. Can you see that, Buzz? Yes, that works, and I hear you as well. So good luck. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, uh, Charlie Wilson, who came up with the original concept for this work. And as you'll see, we've been working with um, members of the image team. So a lot of work about lifestyles and IAMs is looking at ways to reflect scenario narratives about people's behavior in the model assumptions and the model constraints. But what we're asking is a different question. If we take the output of a scenario run, what can we say about the implications of that scenario for daily life? Our focus is on translating IAM output for a non-specialist audience. National and international targets are necessarily stated as high-level aggregated emissions or percentage reductions, but this may not mean much to most members of the public. To get support for targets, it's important to ensure that citizens understand what the impact of these targets are on their everyday lives and how the way that they use energy needs to change to meet the ambitions. We're aiming to bridge the gap between policy and lifestyles by making IAM output accessible and relevant to the general public. The underlying principle of the method is to take the final energy demand output for a region and allocate it across countries and then across household archetypes so that the country information is consistent with the global energy balance and climate projections from the IAM. So to start with an outline of the method, the first step is to disaggregate regional final energy use. For example, to take the final energy for all transport and disaggregate it down to passenger tr transport and freight. And then we downscale from the region to the country. And, and the next step is then to decompose to different forms of service. For example, uh, following on from the transport example, to de decompose between electric vehicles and internal combustion engine cars. And finally, we differentiate the energy used by different types of household, which allows us to describe the pathway that they'll be following. So we look at the amount and type of energy used by a household now and the projection for a future date. This means we can describe pathways of change which are consistent with the IAM projections. So far, my work's been focusing on two major energy services used by households, heating and transport. This method needs additional information as well as the high level IAM output, in particular granular data to break down energy use now and some assumptions about how the relative proportions vary over time. So my next slide, um, I'll illustrate this by talking about the steps for residential heating. Um, I hope this isn't too unclear. I, I can see it's not um, showing up terribly clearly on the screen. But um, in the middle, um, the, the um, steps in black are the, the five steps that I've, be, uh, I've just outlined with the, um, the different outputs at each stage. Um, and then on the left hand side, I'm indicating the granular data about energy use now, which is needed to feed into the calculations. And on the right are the assumptions that are needed to project that um, forward into the future. So to disaggregate and downscale to the country level, 
the current share of regional space heat and, and mix of heating fuels. Um, I'm sorry, I should have said this is a, a, the diagram for residential heating. So I'm looking at the share of, re of the overall region, um, the share of space heating today, and then projecting that forward to the future, and also looking at the mix of fuels being used today um, and um, looking at how that's going to change over time. Um, and in order to do that, I'm making assumptions about the ratios which stay constant um, until the target year. For example, the ratio of the space heating in the country now to the regional total. At the household level, proportions of heating demand by different types of household now are used as a starting point and future nat national heating types energy total is allocated across the different housing types, taking into account how suitable different heating types are for different types of building. I'm going to briefly illustrate what can be done with this method when it's applied to a specific scenario. I don't have time to talk about the details of the results. Um, my aim today is to give a flavour of what's possible, showing some questions that can be addressed and illustrate some of the options for communication with the public. The background for my work is that I'm taking output from an image scenario as part of my work for the Centre for Climate Change and, and the Centre for Climate and Social Transformation in the UK. This will be used by colleagues who are running workshops with members of the public, investigating the accessibility of different emissions reductions, it, 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 investigating, I'm sorry, the acceptability of different emissions reduction pathways. In these examples, a one and a half degree C low B BEX scenario is used, which has significant demand side changes. So my first example is for um, passenger transport in the UK. And the, the slide shows the changes that are implied by this 1.5 degree scenario for households in the UK. So we're looking at um, kilometres travelled per household in um, 2020 and then looking forward to 2050. Great. Um, so I hope this is clearer. Um, so this is um, taking the passenger transport figures for 2020 and 2050. Um, and you can see the x-axis is the activity level, which is passenger kilometres per household. And the y-axis is the energy intensity in terms of megajoules per passenger kilometre. And the colours are representing the energy use, um, uh, the, the, different, uh, the different types of fuels used. So the area of the boxes is the total energy, um, with each colour being a different fuel. So we can see the shift here from the, um, um, the LDVs with petroleum in, in 2010, with a major shift to electric vehicles in 2050 under this scenario and also a reduction in the air travel um, under this scenario. Um, another example of, of what this method can be used for is to look at um, country level comparisons. So maybe providing a bridge between IAM output and, and national policy debates. So here are some charts to compare the heating energy breakdown for the UK and for Sweden. Um, the bar charts show the useful heating energy delivered per household and indicate the proportional share of each type of fuel. In both countries, you can see that the height of the bars go down. In other words, there's a significant improvement in building energy efficiency implied by the scenario. However, the UK has much more to do in shifting from high to low carbon fuels compared to Sweden, because Sweden's already using high proportions of electric, biomass and district heating. So there's, there's no real need to shift um, um, those fuels. Well, the UK has a very high proportion of gas heating at the moment, which needs to um, decrease quite dramatically. So this sort of analysis could contribute to debates about changes in infrastructure needed and the impact on, on, of these infrastructure changes on households. My final illustration is to look at heating energy at the household archetype level. The current house, UK housing stock was divided into four archetypes based on the age and the size of the buildings. I plotted heating energy per household in the same way as the previous, um, on the previous slide, um, but this time it's broken down by the, the different types of building.
Using information from a national housing survey, the share of different heating systems in 2010 can be identified. Then the country level heating energy protections for future years are allocated across the different housing set, um, types based on assumptions about the suitability of the heating systems for different types of homes. The obvious example being that district heating is most cost effective for small homes in dense urban areas. In this UK example, larger homes take a higher share of the national shift from gas to electric heat pumps as they have more space to locate the heat pumps. Um, and you can see that the older homes need a more fabric improvement than the newer ones done do. So I've given examples from a specific scenario, but the method could be applied to any IAM and any scenario. And it opens up the potential for an add-on tool which could post-process IAM output. And it could also be used to provide standard country reports showing the results for a particular country of interest. So to conclude, um, I hope this method can be used to help the public understand the impact of their lifestyles on high level regional information from IAMs and that it can con contribute to policy debates by informing both policymakers and the general public about the lifestyle changes implied by targets. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Claire. Um, that was really nice. Questions might take a little while again to, to come in. Um, in the meantime, I might actually um, have one on where you think this work might be going in the in the future and how to make this. Uh, does this work with any IEM or do you need specific data from the IEM actually to, uh, to a level of granularity in the integrated assessment model actually to make this work? Right. Um, the the basic generic model has been set up so that it could be used with data from um, any IM at a high level. So, um, so far we've taken um, data from image, which obviously has quite granular data available, um, but we could take it from any any level um, and then um, uh, apply various assumptions to, to follow through the different steps. Um, so, well, I think one of the reasons for presenting the method today is to um, is we'd be very interested to hear about ideas for taking this further. Um, it's been developed as part of a specific UK project with, a, um, as I mentioned, um, to feed through to workshops with the public um, looking at a, a one and a half degree scenario. But clearly there's plenty of potential to look at other scenarios, other IAMs, other audiences. Yeah, definitely. I see we got one question uh, coming from Jan Bakkers actually on um, whether if you do this in this order when you're downscaling the integrated assessment model results to the lifestyles, whether you might be actually missing important feedbacks or actions that you can take on the on the locally or around lifestyle that then don't go back to the to the integrated assessment model. Yes, yeah, so. Um, I mean, we are just taking output from the IAM as our starting point uh, and taking that as fixed. Um, so we're not looking at, um, we are just then dividing up that energy use and obviously the associated emissions um, uh, based on assumptions. So we're not then having any sort of feedback into um, uh, the model itself. Um, we are just taking the output and, and taking that as our starting point. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Claire. Um, very interesting. Virtual applause for you as well. Um, let's move on to the last speaker. And before bringing Nicole van der Berg on uh, stage, or welcome, come on stage actually and set up, please. Um, I want to um, announce that after Nicole's talk, we have another 15 minutes for a panel discussion with all of the speakers. Um, and uh, to make my own life a little bit more questions to the to put them in now and maybe even vote on them so that they uh, the, that the questions that most of you are wondering about are are uh, surfacing on top by the time that we have all of the six speakers here on the on the stage um, so do that it might make my own life with the interface here uh, more complicated but we'll see about that um, so Nicole uh, welcome for the last presentation here on the in this session uh, to talk about a decomposition tool for assessing the effects of consumption changes on uh, for different 
uh, scenarios. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is Nicole Vandenberg, um, and I am working on my PhD. And one of uh, the research papers that we worked on was a decomposition tool of how to analyze per capita emissions from a consumer perspective. So really incorporating uh, lifestyles as as the, the lens here. Um, and these are some of the contributing authors uh, to this work, many of who are in this session. Uh, so let me get started. Um, so our research was split up really pretty much into a development part and an analysis part. Under the development part, we looked at what tool could best illuminate uh, different effects uh, of different measures on per capita emissions. Um, and then on the analysis side of how do different uh, factors contribute to per capita emissions in various scenarios. Uh, so on the development, the decomposition tool I will discuss, uh, also on the transport and residential variables within this tool, and then on the analysis part, some of the scenarios that we considered in the descriptions, uh, and also the, the, the results uh, of this decomposition analysis and, and these scenarios. Um, so on the development side, uh, this is a decomposition tool to uh, analyze scenarios, um, and it's based on the image model. Uh, but we hope to uh, eventually uh, bring it into, um, uh, uh, yeah, how do you say, like a, a more generic model. Um, so we split this up into consumption changes and technology changes uh, and the four different factors that contribute to per capita emissions. So under consumption changes was activity, which is consumption per capita very generally. Um, and then we consider structure for transport and service for residential and represent this as pretty much a percentage. And then the technology changes are intensity and fuel mix. Um, and, and so we consider this uh, in more detail in, the, in this slide here. So we looked at transport and residential and under transport, we looked at the different modes of transportation and residential, um, we looked at space heating, space cooling, appliances, water heating and cooking. And this also links quite well to uh, the avoid shift improve framework, which I've presented in, in previous um, uh, 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 IMC conferences. So maybe people will recognize that. Uh, but I'll give an example of um, transport, for example, and how that links to the different factors. So passenger kilometer is obviously activity. Uh, structure is the, the mode percentage. So this is where mode shift would, would be measured. Uh, the intensity is gigajoules per person kilometers, and fuel mix is tons CO2 per gigajoules. And then we replicated this to the residential sector I won't go into too much detail here, but basically in, in a similar way that you would see a, a, a activity changes, you can also see that within uh, space heating as floor space per, uh, per capita in space cooling, the, the whether you adopt a air conditioning unit, appliances is just the number of appliances per capita, uh, water heating, we here uh, uh, looked at only three available uh, from, from image, um, and, and with cooking, we looked at these two. And then similar way with uh, uh, services, we looked at uh, heating degree days. With space cooling, we looked at uh, cooling degree days and appliances like a behavioral efficiency percentage. Um, and then the, the intensity and fuel mix is pretty much comparable for, for all of these different categories. Intensity being um, efficiency improvements which show up in these categories and, and fuel mix improvements. Uh, would show up in this category over here. Um, so going to the scenarios that we considered, uh, we looked at three different uh, scenarios. Um, we looked at a baseline scenario, which is the SSP middle of the road scenario uh, that assumes uh, current economic trends and patterns. So that includes the lifestyle patterns. Um, and then we looked at a behavior change scenario, which was developed by uh, uh, Maria von Sleisart, who's also in this session with us. Um, and which considered several behavioral uh, changes. And then on top of that, we also considered a behavior change in addition to uh, a carbon tax to reach two degrees uh, target. Uh, but to go into more details about this behavior change scenario, um, we I'll break down some of the, 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 the measures that were considered. Uh, so under transport, uh, there was reduced vehicle use, which we 
uh, said fell in the this, uh, activity uh, category. Uh, the mode shift to public transport falls under structure. Uh, the capping of household dimensions, so this is uh, floor space per capita under activity, reduced heating and cooling demand would actually fall under service because it has an impact on HDD and CDD, and reduced appliance ownership under activity. Also, more efficient use of appliances. So this is, uh, you already have the appliance, but how do you use it? This falls under service, and reduced water heating uh, is at, under activity. So um, going into to our decomposition analysis results, uh, this is how we set it up. And as you can see, um, it shows the difference between 2015 and 2050 and how the different factors, uh, uh, activity, structure, uh, intensity, and fuel mix contribute to these changes in emissions. And on the y-axis, you can see tons CO2 per capita. Um, so I will show you uh, that, the, yeah, this is the activity the structure, intensity, and fuel mix. Um, and we looked at this specific graph is for world average. Um, and we look specifically here for transport. And as you can see, the different colors here represent the different modes of transportation. Uh, and I'll walk you through this first one here. So this is basically how, how the situation was in 2015 uh, and, and how activity uh, causes an increase in Ton CO2 per capita, uh, and, and depending on which uh, mode of transportation, whether it goes up. Uh, and then shift, you can see, uh, sorry, in structure, which is influenced by mode shifts, you can see that there's an uh, increase in, in car use, but there's also a slightly decrease in bus use. I mean, this is just an example here, but you can see the intensity uh, goes down even in a baseline scenario and then uh, fuel, fuel mix uh, improvements as well. But then the interesting part here is to show what happens when you add behavior change to it. Uh, so you can see the biggest uh, effect here is um, on, on uh, structure, the, 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 the mode shifts are mostly observed here. Um, and this is uh, from a shift from um, car use to train, um, and a reduction relative to the baseline scenario of, of air travel. Uh, but then when you add a, a carbon tax here in the two degree scenario, you can see that most of the changes are observed in intensity and fuel mix, um, but also notable that it is an activity reduction. Uh, so this is specifically for uh, global average, but I will show you some uh, examples for regional differences. So we looked at a selection of developed and developing regions um, and you can see that there's an opposite trend happening here, that developed regions have a, a reduction in emissions and developing regions have obviously an inc increasing amount of uh, emissions. And this is um, mostly due to economic growth expected for these developing regions. Uh, it's also important to note that these are uh, quite different scales here. Uh, that developed regions have a uh, five-fold higher scale than developing regions. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, what's also important to, to, to notice here is that the differences in, in mode uh, split, um, that for the developed regions, most of the, the shifts are happening uh, from car and air travel to uh, high-speed trains. And uh, so that's that's where most of the observation is, uh, or most of the, uh, the effects are happening. Whereas developing regions, there's a significant shift from uh, car travel, but then more towards trains and uh, buses. So that's also an interesting uh, observation. Uh, and so you can see here for the two degree scenario uh, that this is where we were five years ago and where we would have to go in 2050 to meet our two degree target. Uh, we did the same thing for residential. Uh, so here it's important to note that the differences in, in, in colors are um, uh, the different energy services. So blue is represented by space cooling, uh, orange is represented by space heating, uh, green by cooking and, and red water heating and purple appliances. Uh, 
what's uh, also important to note is, is that any changes that are happening here within structure, specifically for space heating and space cooling, is not just because of behavioral measures, but also because of climate effects. So um, as uh, as it gets warmer, how does this impact uh, our, our energy demand uh, for these particular energy services? Um, what's interesting to note uh, with the behavior change and the behavior change in two degree scenario is that uh, just with the only behavioral measures that there is already quite a difference in activity. Uh, and this could be uh, due to uh, a capping of appliances, uh, but also a capping of floor space. This is also quite notable in these uh, instances. Um, what's interesting for the two degree scenarios, so this is the scenario with the carbon tax, is most of the, the emission reductions are found within fuel mix, uh, also some in, in intensity, of course. Uh, so this is where you could see these observations between uh, behavioral measures and, and uh, climate policy. And then just a concluding slide um, and, and perhaps some recommendations. On the development side, we found that this was an effective tool for image scenarios, uh, but that there is also a possibility to expand this tool, uh, for example, by looking at not just two uh, ti uh, time well, years, but looking at multiple time steps, perhaps even annually, um, and also to consider more factors. So in this case, we looked at uh, three, sometimes two um, factors in particular energy services, but we could theoretically uh, add more. Uh, so this is something to consider. And then also to broaden our application of this tool to other integrated assessment models. Um, and this could theoretically be done by adapting the, the tool to uh, variables available from other integrated assessment models. And then on the analysis side, we found that uh, the behavior changes uh, in the scenario had a significant impact on uh, uh, transport mode shift and on residential activities. Um, but of course, that there is an endless amount of opportunities to explore other scenarios that could theoretically um, consider more cross-cutting lifestyle changes um, uh, heterogene heterogeneous uh, adoption rates and also equity considerations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nicole. That was uh, great. Um, any questions for uh, Nicole? It seems you switch off your camera or something because now we see just your Asymmetric. Yeah, sorry. As I, <laughs> the, the sharing it just appears. Um, let me see. I don't not did not see any questions yet. Um, uh, come in. Um, what are the are there very specific needs that you would need if you want to use this tool indeed with other uh, with other integrated assessment models? Do they need very specific requirements actually in order to uh, for you to be able to run on them? Yeah, so I think in, in, in theory, um, it would be best to try and get it into the form of this activity um, uh, structure intensity fuel mix, because then you're, you're working it in the intended way. Um, but so what we did, sometimes we had to merge to if they weren't available. And then you just have to take that into consideration when you're uh, analyzing the results. Um, but what we've also found in image is sometimes there's variables, but if, if you tweak them a little, you can actually get them into the format uh, and, and have all the variables available. So it's, uh, I guess it's more of like a guideline. If you can get it into this format, this, it could be used um, for other models as well. Okay. Um. Well, there's one straightforward question on whether the results of the consumption changes are coming from image at the moment. Um, I yeah. assume that's a yeah. <laughs> relatively yeah. yes question, yeah. yes. Um, and then it was interesting to have some indication of activity importance in the base year, mostly when comparing OECD with developing countries. Is it important to highlight the unmet requirements, whether whether you're sort of fill, fulfilling the latent demand in the scenario. Can you see that here? Yeah, I'm wondering 
how yeah i mean i think that uh you don't really see that in this situation because um yeah i guess the the developing regions and the developed regions that we considered um were more on the extreme side so the developed regions would be almost the oecd countries um but i don't know if there would be an indication of importance that you would be able to pick up from this. You're mostly looking at the differences between the two years. Um, but I think, I mean, in theory, you can, you can look at it in, in more detail for sure.